You're listening to The Local Maximum, episode 82. Time to expand your perspective. Welcome to The Local Maximum. Now, here's your host, Max Sklar. Hello, everyone. You have reached another Local Maximum. I have been wanting to have Henry Abramson on the show since I started The Local Maximum. This is the unlikely YouTube hit lecture you will hear from in a minute, but I want to say a little bit about why this is the right time for this interview. A couple months ago, in episode 70, I gave my ode to the Potiverse, and I talk about Potiverse, Potosphere, I don't know what to call it, but I called it Potiverse in, in, uh, in that one. Um, and I talked about the downsides of various social media platforms, but it was meant to be a positive monologue about the power of free information and what podcasting has done for that. And there's a lot of focus right now on YouTube, and the focus is all on the negative. All of the major news organizations have been running stories about YouTube's sinister algorithms, getting people very upset about that, leading people down a dark path. And I don't deny that there are lots of problems on the internet, and we, you know, we talk about some of them in the discussion that you're about to hear. But Despite that, sometimes I get this feeling that the narrative coming out now is driven by this dark force aimed at undermining the unprecedented tools that we have to share with each other in the 21st century, almost like a, a, a reactionary or a counter-revolutionary force. I don't know how you, you put it. So I, I needed to highlight someone who's doing kind of masterful work on YouTube, and that would be Henry Abramson's Jewish History Lectures. I found these lectures online several years ago through the YouTube algorithm, believe it or not. And if I were to make a list of the content that inspired me to start uh, recording The Local Maximum, putting it out there, this would be on it. Henry Abramson is a specialist in Jewish history and thought, a native of northern Ontario, Canada, and currently serving as the dean of Toro College here in Brooklyn, New York, He's created, I think, hundreds of history lectures posted on YouTube. They are very high quality. He also has a bunch of books, too, related to his various research specialties, which I'll talk about at the end. Don't miss my additional thoughts after the interview. Let's not waste any more time. Let's bring it up. Henry Abramson, welcome to the show. Welcome to The Local Maximum. I am so excited to be here. So let's talk about your huge body of work on the Jewish history videos online, and you have more than videos, I know that, we'll talk about that a little bit, but why did you start putting these instructional videos online, or, or, or did you initially set out to create you know, such a large body of content, or did you kind of try it out for a while before you realized what you were really up to? It's a great question. Uh, the truth is, I'm just making it up as I go along. Yeah, uh, for years now. For years now, yeah, and it's really, it's, it's changed my life and changed my scholarship, and uh, I'm very pleased with what's happening, but I still haven't figured it out. I got into it when I was just giving, you know, congregational adult education lectures. Uh, my daytime job is basically as a, as a professor or an administrator in a college, and at night, just to kind of do something nice for the community, I would give a Jewish history lecture in a local uh, synagogue. And uh, then I started reading the work of a man named Clay Shirky, who is a pretty brilliant uh, media analyst. Is he at NYU? Yes, he is. He's at NYU. He's, he's an amazing thinker. Wow. I'm just overwhelmed with his work. And um, I realized that, you know, uh, for all of us who were born before 1985, we're like the generation of Jews who remembered what Egyptian servitude was like. <laughs> and and we, we don't have the intellectual tools to naturally make it into the promised land. Those people are the digital natives who were born, you know, after the the, uh, the internet was discovered and revealed to the rest of us. And I realized that I was very much thinking in a kind of an Egyptian mindset by giving a lecture one at a time to like 40 or 50 people, and then it was over and never repeated again. But Clay Shirky's work really turned me on to the idea that not only could I vastly expand my reach and find a much larger audience, but not not only that, the size of it, but as he likes to say in his work, more is different. That when you reach a certain size of audience, 
uh, the actual nature of the interaction changes dramatically. I'll give you one quick example yeah. from, from his thought. Um, he comes from somewhere in the Midwest of Kansas or something like that. And he says how he was amazed that when he came to uh, Manhattan, which is an island right next to the holy city of Brooklyn where we're speaking right now, uh, he was amazed that they could serve pizza 24 hours a day because in his home down in Kansas, if you wanted a pizza, it was a major endeavor. You had to plan it. You had to order it in advance. You had to wait for it, you know, because who could order eight, ten slices of pizza at once? But because there was such demand in Manhattan, suddenly pizza becomes a casual eating thing. And the nature of pizza consumption changes because there's so many people using it. And so I said, well, why don't I just try this with my congregational lectures? And I started putting them on the line. And my gosh, the audience just exploded. And a lot of amazing things happened as a result. So did you have uh, your videos on other platforms aside from YouTube? Or is it mostly YouTube where it exploded? Or uh, It's primarily in YouTube. Right. Um, I, I hope we're going to speak a little bit about the various platforms and my experimentation with them. Because... Well, let's talk about it now. Okay, uh, yeah. great. So to tell me a little bit about what platforms did you try, which worked more than others for you? Well, uh, I, I simply cannot understand Instagram. I keep on getting my teenagers to try to explain it to me, but I don't get it. I also don't really understand what a meme is. But uh, yeah, Well, uh, all right. Well, <laughs> I'll talk about it. It's just hard. I have a problem with this podcast trying to – I know when I post a picture on Instagram of like a nice picture, I get a lot of interaction. But I don't know how to promote the podcast on there. So right. same I, thing. I really I don't could make memes, but I don't want to sit there and do that. I'm too busy. <laughs> I, I just don't understand how they work. And I think it's fascinating because, you know, I'll put something on, let's say, Instagram – that I think is really fascinating, a lot of content and interesting, and right. I'll get you know X amount of likes, and then I'll put some stupid picture that I happen to take a selfie of myself, and I'll get like hundreds of people are so happy with this. And that's think, that's what Instagram is. That's what Instagram is all about. What's that? I don't understand. That's it. just How I don't know. Some things work and some yeah. things don't. I just don't get it. Yeah. So Instagram, besides the fact the videos are too short, I usually give like. I, I give different series, but normally my videos are about 45 to 60 minutes long. It's a proper academic lecture. I mean, for a popular audience, but nevertheless a more serious lecture. Um, Facebook was great. I, I still put things up on Facebook, but I don't understand how to leverage it. It, it expands the audience, but I don't get the same kind of interactivity that I, I get on YouTube. Um, uh, linking to it... From my WordPress site into LinkedIn and Twitter also gets some traction, but not nearly as, as large as YouTube. Um, the, the weird thing about YouTube, though, is that the audience is so broad that I come into contact with you know, the law of unintended consequences. With yeah. audiences I may not necessarily want. Uh, yeah, I actually have a question about that way down below here, but let's talk about that right now because right. you must get in contact with people from all over the world through this material. Um, what's the most surprising listener or message that you've gotten? Oh, my gosh. I've gotten, uh, well, actually, probably the most, I've gotten a lot of really nice uh, feedback from people who yeah. say, you know, these changed my life, that, you know, I, I, I've gotten like people have sent me photographs of believe it or not, small shrines that they have created in their home to my lectures with large <laughs> screen TVs and like ma flags of Israel. And they, they take pictures of themselves standing in front of a screenshot of me giving me a lecture. Right. And that's kind of weird. It makes me wonder about what's going on in America. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I get a lot of that nice stuff. But what's really surprising is the negative stuff that I get from time to time. Sometimes it's like way too much nice. Like, for example, there's this one person who I'm, I hope does not listen to your podcast because she wrote to me a few times and she, she confessed that what she really wanted was to become my concubine. Oh, God. Yeah, I know. So that's <laughs> like the police. I haven't gotten that, but I've gotten, uh, even in this small podcast, I've gotten long, long letters. You know, it's yeah. a little too long. Well, I'll send you her contact information no, afterwards. No, she uh, lives uh, way out west, so no, hopefully. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a weird one. And then, um, and I get uh, a ridiculous amount of anti-Semites involved yeah. in the site. That's really weird. Um, so do you read the YouTube comments? Because they could be a little rough sometimes. And sometimes I don't know who's posting them. I don't know if it's a real, sometimes it's not necessarily a real person. Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and 
Sometimes it's not necessarily anti-Semites, but it could be like people with all these weird theories that you're yes. not really sure. Yes. Do, you, I, do, do you have any more insight into that than me? Because I have no idea what's going on sometimes sure. in these comments. No, again, I, I, I want to emphasize that the vast majority of people who comment say yeah. really nice things, and I'm really happy with that. The, you know, and, and YouTube gives me an analytics on I'm usually around 90% liked, which that's, that's, that's the nice thing. You know, get 100 yeah. nice comments, you get one negative comment, and that's the one that always sticks out in your mind. Well, no, that, I mean, they're like from another planet. Yeah, yeah. So I, I try different things. Uh, first, because I want to keep it kind of like an open classroom format, right. uh, I started out by not deleting any comments. I usually, usually try to respond, yeah. but I, I stopped deleting comments. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I wanted to let people say things, even if they were offensive and so on. Yeah, you don't want to be like the censor or the, right. you know. But then I got to a point where... Uh, I had to say, look, some of this I have to remove. Yeah. Uh, YouTube does filter out a lot of stuff when they use profanity or certainly uh, messages involving violence. YouTube will usually catch those. And I think their online, the online behavior of these commenters also flag them for other things. Uh, so then I started, you know, selectively deleting those ones that were really offensive and, and scary. Yeah. Um, sometimes I respond. Sometimes I feel like, well, this is such a crazy thing. I have to say something back. I get, I get like an idea in my head of a really clever response and I put it in. But I usually regret that because I usually get a bounce back of much more craziness. And it's better yeah. to let it go. Occasionally, my favorite thing to do is I take the crazy comment. I include my witty comeback. I do a screenshot of it. And then I post it onto Twitter. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a good. That, I've heard that as a promotional right. technique, and then and you I could delete. actually profit from the. <laughs> yeah, I delete yeah. it afterwards, so that way I don't engage in a conversation with these crazy people, but I can still, you know, kind of mitigate my my anger and hurt feelings by putting it somewhere else and getting a more receptive audience. Yeah, um, no, that's a well known thing. Like people, uh, you know, people you know fill up their email lists and uh and like fundraise off of like stuff that's uh thrown at them so um, <laughs> i haven't done that no no, no i haven't figured I, out either I, but i also, know that people do that you know and part of it is i i, I want to protect my students from right. some of this stuff so sometimes when there's a really nasty comment on a, a video my students feel like they have to come to my defense or something and yeah. then that goes off into a you know a huge pattern of negativity that I just so it's easier sometimes yeah. just to delete those people yeah uh, I mean those comments uh, no right. deleting people. <laughs> yeah. yeah there's a lot of stuff that you see online that you, interactions you would never have in real life and you almost wonder you know whether these people are really out there or someone who you would interact with in real life or if it's someone who is just you know maybe it's someone who's just very different in real life and has a problem when they sit down at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. I don't know. No, I, th I think uh, one of the policies that that makes Facebook better is the, and I don't know how well it's applied, but the real name policy. Oh, yeah. You know, like on YouTube, when you have, you can you can sign yourself up as 666 Satan Spawn, you know, then yeah. who knows what you can say behind that <laughs> yeah, identity. Yeah, that's going to be, <laughs> I'm sure people will see what that guy has to say. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, Free education, especially on topics that you people rarely get in school. I think in your case, you know, even people who studied Jewish history in school are going to find topics on your videos that they didn't know anything about. And so everyone likes the idea of free education uh, when they don't actually have to do anything, especially in yours when they, there's no homework. But a few people actually, I, a few people, few people actually work to provide these materials because... You know, to provide free educational materials, it takes a lot of time. You have to figure out the logistics. I just see around here you have all this recording equipment, and um, you. I assume you have a lot of support from the university, but it's not. It's not so easy. I run around a lot with this podcast, which is eh, education and entertainment. Yeah. But uh, how do you make it work? Oh, that, that's a great question. So, um, well, it has evolved in some ways. I mean, it started out with just a. A camera in, and, and a, one of my students uh, managed to get a small subsidy to get him to actually move the camera left and right as I walk back and forth in in the synagogue setting, um, and um, then it evolved into doing things in my office with a green screen and things like that. And the university is extremely helpful in uh, just giving me a space to work on these things. Yeah, uh, I'm motivated though by. Uh, a larger concern that 
you know, first of all, I, I deeply believe in the value of studying this history. I think it is a fascinating aspect of human civilizations. Uh, I think it has a lot to say about Jews today and their self-identity. I think it has a lot to say about, uh, you know, how we can improve the world by letting people know the, the amazing things that go on in, in other cultures. Uh, and I feel very strongly that one of the fantastic things about the internet is that it is free. And information should be free. I think we're at a moment that's a lot like the, the Gutenberg period when uh, learning became democratized by lowering the threshold of costs for uh, the access to information. And I think that you know we have to do that even further with the internet today. So, you know, there, there are, in Jewish history specifically, there are two moments that are similar over the span of millennia. Uh, the first moment was around the year 200 of the Common Era when Jews were working with a largely oral tradition. And because of the failure of three successive Roman Jewish wars, um, the, a very important leader of the Jewish people named Judah the Prince, Yehuda Anasi, he decided that you should take all of these oral teachings, which had been handed down for centuries, rabbi to student, and commitment to the right. And, and that's essentially what became the Talmud, is a, uh, it, it's a codification of all of these oral teachings. So moving from an oral culture to a manuscript culture was huge and had significant impact because it meant that Judaism became portable and Jews could exist in the diaspora. The next major shift was uh, some 1,300 years later with the discovery of printing or the invention of printing, which Jews just took to faster than sushi. I mean, it was such an amazing thing for Jews. They loved it. Uh, it dropped the cost of, of accessing these manuscripts, which were hugely expensive, so that suddenly learning expanded to much larger segments of the population. The Talmud, which in the modern printing takes about 20 volumes, you know, you'd have a synagogue that before printing might have, I don't know, five manuscripts, four manuscripts for yeah. thousands of people. And all of a sudden, it was affordable for everyone to have in their home, all 20 volumes. Yeah. And we're living in that kind of moment right now where the Internet is so accessible. I mean, my, my telephone, my telephone, I can't even say that, my phone, my phone has, has more Talmud in it than you would possess in, you know, the average synagogue for most of Jewish history. Right. So I think that we have to take advantage of this technology to make it as, as easy as possible for people to access the information they need. Yeah, so I noticed that you have a manifesto. Is that what this is about? Absolutely. This is a manifesto for sure. Where, 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 when did you put that together? What was the... Well, um, besides Clay Shirky's writings, which, um, yeah. you know, they really changed the way I think about uh, technology, um, I was reading a lot of Simon Sinek at the time, and he wrote an amazing book called Start With Why?, which said to me, okay, I, I found this really cool thing that, you know, my, my lectures that used to reach 40 people a week now are reaching like 100, 200. Now as we speak, they're reaching about 3,000 a day. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, I said, well, why am I doing this? What's the purpose of it? And I realized that I had to codify my thoughts and put them, of course, on the Internet. And that's what that manifesto is. Ultimately, uh, I believe that I mean, I have several points in the manifesto, but uh, for the purposes of our discussion, I believe there's something just intrinsically beautiful about sharing the way one culture appreciates the human condition and that it can inform how all of us approach our own existence in this universe. Yeah, it's interesting. I, going back to the printing press, I was, I don't know if I'm going to include this in, but when I was in Ukraine uh, recently and I visited the, the town where my ancestors are from, there are no Jews left there, but I did, I, I went to like a, an old printing press there that was, it was religious, it was a, um, you know, Orthodox Christian. Yeah. And the story there was that, uh, you know, they had to have their own printing press because the Catholic side wouldn't let them print what they wanted to print. And then they made me the volunteer to like, like, you know, they showed how the paper was made and the guy would talk to me in U Ukrainian and I would have no idea what to do. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, well, what yeah. town was that, by the way? Uh, Radomashil. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. Okay, uh, so it's towards the west of Ukraine, right? 
uh, yeah, it, it was about an hour outside of Kiev. And I was surprised. I thought it was going to be like a real backwater, but it turned out to be just kind of a nice town, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe an hour drive from, from Kiev. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I learned a lot about it. Um, I didn't, I didn't see a lot of family stuff. There wasn't a lot left. Maybe, I, maybe I could do more research later, like now that I know what I'm doing, but yeah, when I have time. <laughs> okay. Um, but no, it was, it was actually quite fascinating. Um, so what kind of preparation do you do for each video lecture? Well, uh, again, I, I basically approach this like a regular academic lecture, um, for intelligent lay people. Uh, yeah. I try to, uh, I, I work a lot in educational theory with um, this uh, concept called zone of proximal development, uh, which is uh, pioneered by a guy named Vis Vygotsky, uh, but which basically, it's, it sounds really fancy, but basically what it means is you try and figure out how much your audience knows, and then you teach just above that level. Not so high above that you totally lose them. If you know, if I were to treat it like a graduate seminar, it would blow everyone away and no one would come back. Uh, but not at the level where everybody says, "I already know this. What's the point of this?" So just by reaching a tiny bit above where they are, people feel at the same time they are uh, they're growing, they're learning, but it's not so far away that they um, they feel it's inaccessible and they give up. You know, it's interesting. That is the exact same principle when designing recommendation engines online when you you know uh let's say well at foursquare we did a lot like recommending restaurants and stuff someone goes to dunkin donuts every day yeah. you don't want to recommend them dunkin donuts it's too it's too obvious it's too right, they already right, know right. about it but you also don't want to recommend something that is so outside their usual uh you know Asian preferences Inuit fusion so uh, yeah that that they don't know what it means and it turns yeah. them off you want to have you want to get them there slowly you want to have something that's kind of in their periphery yeah so that's uh that, that's interesting I just yeah that's great that zbd the zone of proximal development okay i'll put that in all of this stuff all of the links and everything that you mentioned will go on the show notes page localmaxradio.com slash 82 oh cool it's a good number um, so to finish the, the thought yeah. on, on well, how do I prepare? So basically I just, you know, I read the secondary literature for the most part. Um, and people seem to like biographies. That, that's a, you know, a, an easy threshold upward into the history. So I basically study someone's life who I think is interesting. I especially enjoy studying people who are on the margins of the historical narrative, uh, women, um, you know, people who are less well-known, and uh, then I present the, the arc of their life within a larger historical context, and I usually like to use Prezi software for presentations, and I guess that's about it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a, a lot of them are biographies. People are, you think it's just people are attracted to narrative or learning about people, or why do you think that is? Well, you know, I, when I first started this, I looked down on biographies. I thought that, you know, that's so small scale. I want to look at larger social phenomena. My first book was like all about, you know, social movements and things like that coming together. Right. And, and I just felt like the macro approach was the right way to understand human history. But the fact is, when you look at an individual human life with its idiosyncrasies, with its personal challenges and tragedies and hopes and aspirations, it, it's easier to connect with it. You can, and, and you can teach it in such a way that you can speak about the larger arc of history simultaneously. And that's essentially uh, why biographies are, are the, a good choice. I, sh I have to give a shout out to my wife, Ilana, who, um, who is not a historian, but she is a very wise uh, guide in all things. And I know I will get points for saying this. Uh, but she's, she essentially said, why don't you give like a Jewish superheroes course, which is essentially, you know, the big guys in Jewish history, Maimonides and Rashi, things like that, and, uh, and it was really her inspiration. Okay, so let's dive into some specific videos. Last night I went through your YouTube channel and I found the videos with the most view, with the most plays. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know what they are. But I do. Absolutely. I'm going to, okay. <laughs> yeah. like, you know how many everyone gets. All right, so for each one, um, well, it, people might not know who these, these are, so maybe let's talk about um, I'm, I'm going to mention each one in turn, uh, how many views they are, and maybe you could give a couple sentences about who this person is, and maybe some thoughts as to why this video is so popular. 
So the first one in the number three spot, and this one is maybe not so surprising, is Viktor Frankl. Your mm. classroom has 60,000 people in it. Wow, that's no. That's actually I'm really proud that the Viktor Frankl video received such a, uh, a significant audience. Uh, he is a, um, a psychologist who survived the Holocaust. He wrote a book called uh, *Man's Search for Meaning*, which was originally titled *From Death Camp to Existentialism*, and he created a, a school of psychotherapy called Logotherapy. Uh, uh, the, I, I can see why he changed the name of the book. Right, yeah. The, um, there's some controversy around him, which we shouldn't go into right now. But what is, I think, his major contribution to human civilization is his argument that, you know, when you look at the 19th century, the, the era of big ideas, everyone wanted to find, like, one thing that was the, 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 the orbital center of human existence. And Marx said it was all about capital, right? Money. And uh, Freud said it was all about sex. And, uh, you know, they have all of these different, uh, Nietzsche says it was all about power. So Frankl said, no, none of these are correct. What life is all about is meaning. And logotherapy is all about finding what is your own personal sense of meaning. Now, uh, why the Frankel video is so popular, I think, is because it's something that, although he obviously comes from a Jewish background and the Holocaust is a specifically Jewish story to it, but it is so clearly universal. And the internet is way bigger than uh, the, the Jewish audience. And so sure. it reaches deep, uh, and, and a lot of people are deeply touched by that particular video. Uh, I don't even think it was one of my best videos, but it seems to be a lot of people have enjoyed it. Unfortunately, uh, Viktor Frankl has not received uh, enough attention, I think, in um, in the video sphere specifically. And this is one of the few, um, uh, you know, lectures out there that talk about his life and about his theories. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next one. This one's interesting. Uh, King Bulan of Khazaria. <laughs> Here we go. One hundred and six thousand. Views. Okay, so this is one of the, the, the weirder experiences I've had with this. Um, basically, King Bulan is the leader of a group of people in Central Asia called the Khazars, who um, amazingly, uh, in the 8th century, converted en masse to Judaism. So a lot of discussion among scholars trying to piece out exactly, did this really happen? And since we have lots of data points that suggest it did, why did it happen and how deep was that conversion and uh, what happened to those Khazars? I mean, there's a lot of fascinating historical stories about that. It is, however, largely relegated to a footnote in Jewish history because the Khazar Jews did not appear to survive the, uh, the medieval period and we just we don't see many traces of them in um, Anything from DNA studies to uh, to uh, cultural linguistic impact on later populations. So why is this video so popular? Uh, and the reason is because anti-Semites love this video. And there are lots of anti-Semites on the web. They specifically believe that modern Jews today are not the descendants of you know, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Bible, but they are actually descendants of this fake people, this Central Asian people, who have supplanted the, the regular ones. I do want to give a shout out to all those anti-Semites, <laughs> because this happens to be one of the highest earning monetized videos. Wow. Thank you for clicking on those ads. I think there is some kind of correlation between anti-Semitism and watching you know, ads on videos. So thanks for that. But I think, I, I, you know, I ended up having to shut off comments on it because there's too much crazy stuff happening there. This one is interesting to me. I, um, you know, obviously I searched Kazaria online and everything that comes up except for your video is so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, Thank you for but, that. <laughs> but it, it's, it's just um, like if I didn't know anything about it, I just watched your video. I would never think that like Kazaria should be some kind of uh, 
you know, pejorative against Jews or that there's something wrong with being Khazar origin or something like that. Like, I, I don't understand where it comes from that that's like supposed to be an evil thing or something. I no, it's, it's part of like this whole QAnon kind of conspiracy theory thing. Like, you know, all Jews are locked into some world conspiracy to try and dupe the rest of the world into thinking that, you know, they're harmless or who knows what. It, it is really crazy. Um, you know, if there is a Jewish conspiracy, I wish someone would tell me about it so yeah. I can like cash in on it. But it, it, it just it, it feeds into the crazy. And there's a lot of crazy on YouTube. Yeah. All right. So enough on that. Let's go with the last one. The highest video is this. Is, I, I found this interesting, but I didn't think that other people would find this interesting. This is Josephus. Yeah. One hundred and eighty two thousand views. That's like a city. That's like, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a thank you. Josephus, and I'm surprised you didn't include St. Paul in there, too. That's one of my favorite ones. That's actually got a lot of hits, too. It's usually oh. number two under Josephus. Maybe it, I missed that one. It could be because you may have looked at the last 28 days as opposed to the last year or something, but okay. no matter. Anyway, Josephus and, and, and uh, Paul also fit in the same category. Uh, the fact is, there is a, you know, I, I may be making these lectures originally thinking about an primarily an ethnically Jewish audience in a synagogue, for example, or at Turo College, which has a very large Jewish population. It's under Jewish auspices. Uh, but the Internet is so much bigger. And I have a very, very large Christian following who want to know something about Josephus, who was a Jewish historian alive at the first century, and he wrote a history of the Roman-Jewish wars, among other things. And he's extremely important for Christians because he describes what life was like at the time of Jesus. Um, and I often find that a, a large number of my Christian viewers, are, you know, they're religious Christians, they're, they're there because they want to learn about Jesus's life. And from that video and from the St. Paul video, which also deals with that period, uh, they learn a lot more about what, how Jews view the period and, and that there are still Jews around today who are still studying that era. And so I, I think some of my, uh, my warmest uh, connections on YouTube have come about from uh, those kinds of videos where there's a lot more, um, you know, they, they really uh, I, I feel like I'm making a little progress and headway with uh, intercultural communication, interfaith communication, if you will. I get a lot of requests to, uh, to make a video on Jesus, which I think would be immediately a, a really a, a well-consumed video, but um, uh, I don't think I'm quite ready to do that yet. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it would be. Um, so uh, do you have a video that you would like to highlight that comes to mind? I was going to say ask for your favorite, but I, I thought that was unfair. I uh, I don't know if you'd be able to pick a favorite, <laughs> well, but uh, <laughs> yeah. but uh, is there anything that comes to mind that you'd yeah, like to highlight? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, there's some videos that I, I, I really enjoyed making and researching. And in fact, I think that's why people like my videos is because I'm so excited about the material itself. It's so much fun. How can you not love this stuff? And it's an infectious kind of enthusiasm that other people see too. Um, I'm not trying to sell people stuff. I'm not trying to convince them of stuff. I'm just talking about stuff that I find really interesting and, and I think other people share that. So one of my favorites in that regard is a, a video on Babatha, who was um, a woman who lived in second century Israel and for reasons that we're not exactly uh, sure of, she ended up hiding out in the cave system with the Bar Kokhba rebels. This is in the Third Roman Jewish War of that period, a war that ended disastrously for the rebels, with hundreds of villages being burned and, uh, you, know, you know, just terrible consequences. At any rate, uh, archaeological research in the 1960s found a cave where um, tens, maybe hundreds of Bar Kokhba fighters and their families and other people were hiding out from the Romans. Uh, lots of evidence of like children living there, like children's shoes and things like that were found there, and a lot of uh, human remains as well. They, many of them died there. And in that particular cave, which is named for Babatha the Cave of Letters, they discovered 
Oh, and by the way, I have to tell you this one cool thing. Yeah. You know how they found this stuff? No. They they knew that there must be stuff under the floors of the cave systems, but they couldn't see in there. Yeah. So this and so one, where were these caves located? Oh, they they're in the, in the uh, Dead Sea region. Oh, in the Dead Sea region. Okay. Right, near Qumran. And they, so the uh, this one particular archaeologist was discussing the problem with his um, with his um, uh, doctor, uh, who was a what, what do you call those doctors who do colonoscopies? I, I, um, well, I you know I don't know the answer well, to that. <laughs> yeah, I'm over fifty, so I do know, but I forgot it. At any rate, the doctor said, "Oh, hey, no problem. I have exactly the right tool. We'll yeah. use the same tool that I use for a colonoscopy. We'll just extend the wire a little bit." And they said, that's perfect. And what? so they, they said, I know, that's so bizarre, <laughs> right? They took like a colonoscopy tool to the Dead Sea region, and they found uh, this packet of letters that belonged to this woman named Babatha. And it was all her most important personal papers, her legal papers. It talked about her divorce. It talked about her child custody battle. It talked about an inheritance battle she had with her second husband. It was like she was she was hiding out with the rebels, and we know all about her legal life because she had this precious, you know, trove of her personal documents. And I just was so fascinated to get a so view into this woman's th- life. Without that, she yeah. would just be some random person who lived in the ancient world that no one ever heard of. Yeah, right. She she is one of the random people of the ancient yeah, world. But that's and, that's what makes it more interesting because right. that's like someone who, you know, most of the people we've heard of are people who are uh, exceptional. You know, famous. You know, they wrote yeah. something. or Yeah. No, this is a regular average woman with her regular average legal troubles, you know, and – and the, these legal documents tell a whole story of her life, uh, and and we can like reconstruct it. What it must be, and, and amazingly, so much as my my father Oliver Shalom used to say in French, "Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose." The more it changes, the more it stays the same. We can feel the immediacy of her concerns two thousand years later, even today. So uh, that was one of my favorite videos, I think. Yeah, um, I, was, I wrote down a couple that I liked. Um, one was Herod, which I just like. I don't know. I just like the bad guy yeah. <laughs> aspect to it. Um, yeah. uh, and the other was uh, Shmuel Hamag- Hanagid, which oh, yeah, kind of really broke cool the too. broke the expectation a little bit for me because I didn't know about that period. Oh, great! You know, I, I it's just you know, it, there's just so much fascinating stuff you learn about. Yeah. People's aspirations, their their drives, their their heroic, you know, struggle against the uh, the challenges of everyday life. It's it's amazing. It, it's inspirational. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, you might not be surprised to learn that a lot of people are complaining about YouTube these days. We already talked about it a little bit. Uh, the types of videos that you do are not particularly in the crosshairs, but I think that there's a lot of pressure on YouTube and it could affect you. So the two complaints that I've been reading about are totally opposite, which are A, the YouTube people, the Google people really have it out for me and they're not recommending my videos. And B, the YouTube people are recommending these other videos, which are bad for society and they're going to make people violent and ignorant and so forth. So, um, and uh, because they're being pressured on both these sides, it's going to be, um, well, I I think they're, uh, I don't know what they're going to do. So first question, uh, do you have a particular strategy for getting found on YouTube? Do you ever notice that they have like algorithm changes that affect you? You know, um, I'm not very good at this. I, uh, I'm basically a historian. I'm a scholar. What are you talking about, though? You have uh, hundreds of thousands <laughs> yeah. of downloads, and that's a lot for these types of videos. I mean, yeah. there's, I know there's viral videos out there that gets millions, but that's a different sort of a thing. No, I, I do appreciate that. That's very kind. But basically, I have no patience for metadata. I just I put in the default, and I have not changed it in years. It just hmm. you know it says like Jewish history, things like that, um, and and I, I I'm kind of like. I love researching it. I love lecturing it. And then I just I want to forget about it, move on to something new. It's like, you know. Right. Put it out there for people who are looking for it. Yeah. And just, not. So I have not really engaged in trying to push the videos uh, other than word of mouth. And, and I look at the analytics and they're pretty steady. About 25% of my viewers are subscribers and 75% are not. And it's been like that for years. And I suppose I could, you know, try and change that somehow. But um, I'm also not concerned about the recommending videos because although I did monetize them with ads, 
Um, it's, and it's a, it's a tiny amount of money. You know, I take out my wife to dinner once or twice a month on it. Um, it that's not my, what I'm all about. I want it to be free. It has to be free. It doesn't bother me if you can click on an ad or not. That's up to you. But I do not want to put a paywall in front of it. And, and I've been approached by a lot of people who want me to sell these things, and I don't want to do it. That's against the manifesto here. So um, I, I have not been concerned about those things. What I am concerned about with YouTube are a couple things. First of all, uh, with some frequency, they initially put a red flag on my video. And uh, I always click the little button that says, please manually review, and then they let it go. The reason is because obviously somewhere in there, the word Jew <laughs> sends up a red flag. Like anyone who was posting about something. That's with annoying the word that that's like a red flag word. Yeah, I know. It must be a dirty word somehow. But of course, once they look at it, I've never had a video blocked because these are just academic yeah. lectures. But that, that does say something about our society. Um, I, I also find that there are some videos, like the Khazarian video, that uh, get posted onto anti-Semitic websites with regularity. And I'm saying, no, that's not why I do this. And like, uh, you know, the, I, I dislike them using the videos to push an agenda that's not, you know, just trying to understand the history. Um, I even have, and this bothers me, I even ha had the... They'll the, probably post the video, make a point, and then it's a point completely opposite from what you actually said in the video. Oh, exactly. People do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Cutting and pasting sometimes. Yeah. And I have, uh, you know, flagged a few of those if I feel they're really egregious. Another thing that bothers me is that there's this one firm in North Carolina that uh, has been downloading my videos and then selling them to people. Oh, yeah. That <laughs> happened to me once, but that was not... Um, not on a large scale. No, you know, that's and I, crazy. And I sent them like a, I got my the the university lawyers to send them a cease and desist because I, I just think it's nasty. I mean, yeah. I don't care if someone else puts it it's on like, their website. I put it out they, for free. What are you doing? Exactly. It's against the, the whole idea of this. And, and yeah. I feel badly for those people who pay for something that is totally free. Yeah. So those are kind of uh, irritants that I, I get sometimes with YouTube. But on the other hand, um, I think YouTube has done an amazing service. For I mean, it, it's it, it, how can I even say an amazing service? It's, it it has changed society in very profound ways. Right. I mean, I found your videos. I think through the algorithm, probably year, probably like in 2014. Yeah, I remember pretty well because it was like you were in Miami, and it was like negative two degrees here. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch this. Uh, <laughs> but then then I then I stuck with it. Um, okay, so. Uh, second question. This is about you know people who want to learn from YouTube because YouTube is there's a lot of people on YouTube. It's open uh, and it's maybe a, a little different. Uh, they, people have to really think critically about where they're getting their information. Uh, double check kind of what channel they're getting it from. Um, you know, in the classroom setting, you kind of soak in and you kind of lead, let your guard down a little bit and maybe let the professor, you know, tell you what's going on. Maybe people shouldn't do that in the classroom either. But how do you navigate that? Do you have any thoughts on how the average person should navigate that? What you're pointing to is really the, uh, the classical challenges of rhetoric all the way back to the Periclean Age in ancient Greece. And there are three basic criteria that any audience member has to assess and decide whether or not they're going to click on the video or not. Actually, one of the, the statistics I am very proud of is that um, my average retention usually hovers around 16 minutes, which I think is a, that, that's a pretty big number, they tell me, that uh, means that the average person who clicks on my video stays there for 16 minutes. Yeah, that's especially since, you know, I look around at a lot of videos and I'll be like, I'll listen to this one 30 seconds, no, this one 30 yeah. seconds, no. This, you can go through 10, 15 videos before you find one that you listen to. So, so the, those three categories that I try to build my talks around, and this is classical rhetorical study, is um, logos, pathos, and ethos. You know, Latin terms, really Greek terms, that refer to three basic content uh, elements. The first, it, logos means like what is the content of this talk? If you were to put it into a transcript, what would it say? And if it says things like 2 plus 3 equals 17, you know right away this is ridiculous. But if it sounds reasonable, then okay, I'll listen to it on a logical level, hence logos. The second is pathos. Um, does it appeal to me emotionally? 
Like, do I feel a connection with the subject? Do I feel like, wow, I want to know what happens to this person. I want to hear the ending of this story. You know, does it appeal to my pathos? And thirdly, ethos, who is this guy speaking? Does he have credibility? So, you know, the fact that it is, most of my talks are given in a university setting. I, I do have a PhD. Um, you know, people seem to, and this is a weird kind of thing, people seem to um, like me based on my videos. And they don't even know me. And I'm glad they like me. I think that's great. But, you know, I, I've been talking about something other than myself and my life. I haven't talked about well, actually, every now and then I do talk about my life. Yeah. <laughs> but, but people seem to feel like I have an ethos, I have a credibility. So those are the three things, I think, that, that make the video successful. And, and they're, you know, to use the Hebrew term, lishma, they're, they're the real deal. I'm just trying to do this as best as I can. Uh, I'm not asking anyone for money. I'm not asking anyone for commitments. I'm just talking about things that I'm excited about. And, and I'm really glad that, that people enjoy it. How many people come for the jokes? <laughs> I have... Uh, I have mixed uh, ratings on the jokes. <laughs> Some people love them. Other people say things in the comments like, tell this rabbi to stick to his day job. Right? <laughs> right, so, you get uh, hecklers in the, in the comments. Right, right. What I have decided is I got to cut back on the jokes and try to stick to the topic, but I, I can't completely cut them out because they just well up inside me and I have an overwhelming desire to tell them. Yeah, well, I would encourage you to continue. Um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, just so that we can get the, to the rest of the lecture, because otherwise, you know, you're going to be thinking about it the whole lecture, and um, yeah, it feels like it's not right. Yeah, okay, that's uh, that is a really interesting answer, not what I was expecting. So I think we we learned a lot. Um, for people who are interested, what do you think is the best starting point for learning more about Jewish history? My my audience. Um, I would say like 90% of my audience has never, uh, I have a pretty, an audience that's pretty interested in things. So they probably looked at uh, history videos online, but who, wh what do you think is the best starting, starting point for, for people who want to learn more? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, I, I guess I should plug my own stuff first because sure. that's, that's, I'm trying to make it available for people. If you do enjoy consuming your media uh, with videos, then um, my website, which I plug here, henryabramson.com, or it's on YouTube, of course, just, just Google my name. Um, I think that's a great place to start. What I have not done very well is organize it from beginning to end, and i got to put some effort into that. I will be starting, because I'm working on a major written project now, a text project on a, a multi-volume survey history of Jewish history, um, I'm going to put a crash course out there with four uh, lectures on Jewish history that cover everything within a ridiculously short period of time. I also have a series called Essential Lectures Wait, in Jewish History. Say more about that. So that's, um, that's coming out soon? Yes, that'll come out. Hopefully, I'll have it all done by October. Oh, okay. And these are four one-hour lectures that cover ancient, medieval, modern, and contemporary Jewish history, respectively. And it's just kind of like everything you want to know in four hours so that you can sound intelligent and people will not think you're stupid about Jewish history. That sounds pretty, uh, that sounds pretty helpful. Oh, thank you. It's not the only one out there. Um, yeah. But since I'm a member of the pre-digital native generation, most of my Jewish history learning is text-based. I, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts or videos on it. Um, a few significant exceptions, but I tend to prefer using the library and getting text to uh, absorb my history. All right, so as we wrap up, are, do you have any last thoughts, and uh, is there anywhere else people can go to learn more? Oh, okay. Well, I, I would want to mention a project now that I'm involved with that I think is so fantastic. I talked to you about it before we turn on the mics. Uh, I'm working on this project called Jewish History in Dafyomi, which is a, a really broad thinking project uh, organized by an institution called the Orthodox Union in which I'm recording 2,711 videos of Jewish history that coincides with the page-a-day study program of the Talmud called Daf Yomi. And uh, that, it, it's such an exciting thing because it allows me to uh, key into the Talmud, such a crucial source for Jewish thought, 
and connect it to its historical context in a very immediate way. That's also going out on podcasts, and it's going to be an app and things like that. Um, okay, great. And so the websites and everything? Oh, just hen- henryabramson.com. Poorly organized, but it has lots of stuff there. Okay, great. Um, I will post all of that on our show notes page, localmaxradio.com slash 82 when this comes out. This is going to be Labor Day when this comes out. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So, um, great. That, that wraps up the summer. <laughs> Thank you for not asking any hard questions. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Henry Abramson, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks very much. It was great to be here. All right. So, I, uh, I mentioned the jokes, but we didn't actually get to hear one. So, one thing that he said in one of the lectures in one of the videos that made me laugh out loud. And so it's probably not going to make you laugh because I don't know how to say it, but it made me laugh out loud while watching the video. Uh, I don't even think that he didn't plan this out, but it was something like, it's just like randomly in the lecture, like, and then in 455, the Vandals attacked Rome and they spray painted all over the Colosseum. And I just, (laughs) I just fell back laughing. And not only did I laugh, but I looked it up and it appears the word vandalism does come from the historical vandals. So I actually learned something from that. Uh, a couple more points. This was one time in the conversation I spoke about messages that were getting too long. But you know what? I love the long messages I get from you guys. Honestly, I haven't gotten anything unwanted yet. And so I was exaggerating. And I, I, I still want them. And I read all of them. I know that sometimes my response is, take a few days or even a few weeks. Uh, Usually I try to respond in a few days. Uh, And I know that sometimes my responses are much shorter than the message itself, but I do read them. I do enjoy them. And if you want me to say, like, uh, oftentimes they're very long messages, but they don't say, hey, can you address this on the... uh, can you address this on the podcast? Because I would love to do that as well. Uh, so keep sending them, localmaxradio at gmail.com. Another thought, after reviewing the materials online for King Bulan and Kazaria, it occurred to me that the legitimate study of this topic, which is fascinating, is kind of painted or discouraged by the existence of these crackpot theories. So they've almost like broken the the, the study. And it's always going to be in the back of your mind when studying Kazaria now. They kind of ruined it. And I wish that wasn't the case, but I'm glad that there are balanced informational sources out there. I know that the purpose of the Jewish history lectures is not to answer anti-Semitic memes and that sort of stuff, but they do help sometimes. Uh, and also, I realized I was actually live in the audience for both the King Bulan talk and the Viktor Frankl talk rather than watching the video. If you're nearby in Brooklyn, you could actually attend one of these lectures. They're open to the public. Uh, the schedule is posted online at henryabramson.com. I'll link all to all of that. I'll link to more of the videos that we mentioned at localmaxradio.com slash 82 with some additional comments on uh, you know why I found them interesting. And finally... I looked at some of Henry Abramson's books. Uh, I read Torah from the Years of Wrath last year. That was kind of a dark book. Not kind of a dark book. It was a very dark book. But they were sermons that were found from a rabbi in the Warsaw Ghetto as it became increasingly closed in and clear that you know everyone was going to be put to death. And the interesting thing about that one was to see you know how he reacted and think about like how someone would react in that situation, you know, where it's his job to speak spiritually every week to an increasingly dwindling and like starving audience. They they mentioned like the the people in there were, you know, not doing well. And I guess one of my takeaways was that he started with a more standard toolkit that I guess rabbis and spiritual leaders have in these dire situations. But then as the month went on, it was clear that there, there really was no toolkit for this. So that was, um, that was an interesting read. I'll probably read some of his books about Ukraine since I was just there and I have a particular interest in it too. And that's, I think that is that is one of his areas of expertise. So I'll link to them at localmaxradio.com slash 82. All right. I hope all of you in the U.S. enjoyed your three-day weekend, your Labor Day weekend and the rest of the world. I hope you enjoyed your summer and you're looking forward to the end of summer. Oh, wait, I have Australian listeners too. So I hope you had... A good winter, then. Uh, I like this time of year in New York, pre-autumn, but still mild. Uh, It's what summer really should be all summer long. So 
next week. I'm going to do a solo show, and among other things, I'm going to tear down one of the biggest lies about Bitcoin. And uh, the following week, I'm going to talk to physicist Anthony Aguirre about what the universe is fundamentally made of. So don't miss it. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. Have a great week, everyone. That's the show. Remember to check out the website at localmaxradio.com. If you want to contact me, the host, or ask a question that I can answer on the show, send an email to localmaxradio at gmail.com. This show is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and more. If you want to keep up, remember to subscribe to The Local Maximum on one of these platforms and to follow my Twitter account, at Max Sklar. Have a great week. Feel, feel the power. 